19. And as we looked at this earlier, <clears throat> uh, it was a different subject matter altogether, but uh, in John chapter 19, verse 25, uh, it's a fascinating passage in many ways. Uh, but in John 19, 25, here's what it says. John 19, 25, he says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. So he looks at his mother and he says, Behold thy son, speaking of the other man. Uh, some would claim that's John. Verse 27, Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother, meaning to Mary. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. What's he doing here from the cross? One of the things, he only says seven things from the cross. One of the things he says, and the last thing he says before he says it's finished, uh, the, the next to the last thing I guess you'd say it would be, but the idea is what? He takes care of his mother. What's he doing? He's making arrangements, and he says to the disciple, Behold thy mother. In other words, she's yours now to look after. Why is he doing that? Well, he's going to go away. That's why. So he makes that arrangement, which is fantastic. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 5. <clears throat> There's a lot about motherhood in the Bible, and I wish we could go through more of it. Maybe we will in a future time, but today I want to focus on some of the practical things about motherhood and about what mothers go through and, 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 and how they should go through it. And and what they should do to help themselves get through it. And uh, it sounds like a tremendous thing, doesn't it? Well, it is. Uh, and it is a tremendous thing to take on the responsibility of raising children, having them, and raising them, and worrying about them, and all that. So it, we're going to look at it this way, because this verse, to me, is fantastic. First Timothy chapter 5, and uh, Paul begins in verse 1. He says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. Now, he's talking to Timothy, the pastor there at Ephesus, when he says this. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. So there's a certain way you're supposed to treat an elder. And the younger men as brethren. The elder women, how? As mothers. Now, you think they know how to treat their own mother, wouldn't you? Right? And that's what he's saying. Treat them like your own mother. The elder women as mothers. The younger as sisters with all purity. Honor widows that are widows indeed. And he goes on. <clears throat> he gives instructions about these things and about those who uh, are going to be in the congregation and that he's going to be dealing with. The issues in the local church, if you look over on the chart here, the issue in the local church, when he talks about the cross, the church, the coming, and the congregation, this, this one here, the second one, I don't know if you can see it, but the church, talking about the church, the body of Christ, that we talk about so much, but the congregation is the fellowship, the issue of what we do together here on a regular weekly basis. You know, moms are important because they're our first contact with a lot of things, uh, the world. I mean, they're our first tactile contact. I mean, it's that, it's that first time after they come out of the womb, there's, there's got to be somebody waiting for them, right? And there has to be somebody to help them and somebody to take care of them and love them and, and comfort them and feed them and do all those things. I think mothers deserve to be honored. And I believe the Word of God teaches that. Uh, some of the stuff I see that's going on now, uh, these folks, this big thing with the kidnapping over in in uh, Nigeria, <clears throat> kidnapping all these girls and doing all this stuff, and how these people over there, and how people in general around the world think of, of their women. It's terrible. It's just, it's beyond terrible. It's, it's heinous is what it is. And, uh, you know, I, I said to my wife the other night when they were talking about this stuff on the news, I said, Teddy Roosevelt wouldn't have put up with this. Right now, he would have been over there. They're saying, well, we don't have anybody to go do it. We should, they should do it. Why don't we have people on the ground hanging all those men right now? What's the deal? Why are we waiting? 
Well, I'm not going to get political about it, but I am getting upset about it because, you know, to, to kidnap that many women and torture them and do all those things to them, and, then, and now they've, they've killed another 10 or 20, okay, just indiscriminately do this, and the name of their organization is an organization that, that when they translate it, it means that Western civilization is forbidden, or Western education is forbidden. And it's like, wow, they really got a thing. They go to the school, they grab them, they take them out, and, and, they're not, they're not, and, and the government seems helpless. You know, what these people need is they need to get saved, don't they? Because saved people don't act like this. They don't. They have a different outlook on life. And so it's a, it's a wonderful thing when you get a mother who understands the Word of God. A good mother can make all the difference in a man's life and in a, in a daughter's life. A righteous mother is a joy to behold. It's a wonderful thing to watch because it's the way it's supposed to be done. If you want to see how motherhood is supposed to work and motherhood is supposed to be, look at your Bible. God is the one who designed the idea of motherhood, and he's the one that did it, and he's the one that explains it. Mothers have a huge and great responsibility, don't they? It's just tremendous. And, and I, I think of this watching now over the years, uh, watching my wife being a mother, it's, it's like, that's a, it's a daunting thing because they, they really do carry the bulk of the load. Uh, I believe that. And, and they teach us so much. They teach us what love and affection really is. They teach us that because they're constantly showing it to us. We've said to you many times over the years that true charity is love in action. And sometimes you don't know what love in action is if you've never actually received it. And that's why people grow up not knowing how to love other people. Uh, we were talking about this, this issue of children being left alone in cribs, uh, in orphanages. And sometimes in an orphanage there's so many children to take care of they don't get a, enough time. And when there's little ones, when there's babies, uh, they don't always get enough time to be picked up and held. And they don't get enough time to be to be loved and to be to be talked to and to be played with and and we take all that for granted here we do that with our children and yet sometimes we think you know what happens to those children laying in the bed by themselves you know what's happening to them they're getting angry and they scream and they yell just like any kid would do when he wants to be fed and he wants to be changed and he wants to be uh, held and so forth and so as a while what happens to a kid who does that constantly day in and day out week in and week out for the first and second and third year of their life. They grow up very angry. And they get so unmanageable. And they get so, um, I guess you might say, angry. And they don't know who they're angry at. They're just mad. And you know why they're mad? It's because they miss one of the most important parts of that relationship in early in life. They don't know anything about it. They never had it. And consequently, they're, they're actually unable, <laughs> in many cases, to have relationships with people. Uh, they are the ones who teach us. Mothers are the ones who teach us what love and affection is, to provide comfort for us, and to care for us, and to hold us, to teach us right from wrong. You say, well, i got a conscience for that. But, you know, that, that doesn't really kick in right away. You know, you've you got to kind of learn about that conscience because... They have an innate consciousness, yes, but they don't always really know about it until they learn about it. So in the meantime, until they understand who God is and what God's Word teaches about these things, who is to represent God in the home? Mom and Dad. And if they're not able to do it, what happens? Disaster, <laughs> because they end up growing up and uh, they find themselves being lost because nobody gave them the gospel. And uh, we've had several instances in our own assembly here where people get saved and they, one of the things they want to do is get their parents saved. And it's, it's a sad thing. You know, it happens. And it's one of those kind of things where they're working on it and it has to be done, but it, it's hard to do. People are harder to reach when they get older. That's why they're to be reached early, 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 see. 
But you have to have a mother that knows the gospel in order to give it to her children. And th this is a team effort, okay? It's not just the mothers, it's a team effort. They're the ones that teach us to be patient. <laughs> you ever try to teach patience to a little one? Wow. It takes a person with patience to do that. And they teach us to be patient with our nature. And they have to be patient because of our nature. Children have a, a real sense of how the old nature works. You know why? They're professional sinners. They're professional at it. I mean, they are acute. How many of you, have, 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 as you've raised your children, have watched your children go, go through that phase of learning how to lie? You know, in the beginning, they don't just start lying. They have to learn that. But it kind of becomes natural once they figure it out. And they kind of figure it out on their own. But they also can learn it quicker if they got older siblings. So once they begin to lie, they begin to lie in such a way that it's, it's considered to be comical sometimes. You know? And uh, I always liked that little boy in, in Old Yeller when he's telling all the whoppers all the time. And his brother keeps telling him, not quit telling him big whoppers, you know? And he was talking about this. He's got his dog, and they're down in this just water hole. And he went down after this catfish, and he swam in his cave, and there's a big old cat. <laughs> this pond wasn't 20 feet around, you know? And he's swimming down to the bottom, getting in that cave, trying to get this catfish out. And he was holding on to him. And the dog is the one that got in and got the, fa the fish out. It wasn't him. But he was telling his mom the story. You know how kids do that? They just tell one yarn after the other. And, and, and they tell lies. And it's kind of put up with a little bit because people think it's cute. And it's funny. And sometimes it is. Because sometimes the yarns are funny. But the fact is, they're not so funny later on in life. Okay? And what I'm saying today, I don't know about you, but our entire culture, including our government, is lying so much that it's the only way that they know how to communicate. They just don't know. I mean, they grilled our uh, press secretary this week so hard that, I mean, I, I thought the guy was going to break down in tears. And, and he was, they were giving him so much trouble, and they're just flat out saying, that is a lie. Why did you lie? And he says, well, <laughs> it's my job to come out and lie for this guy. Why would you want a job like that? They got to stand in front of 150 uh, reporters every day and lie about what's going on. You know, that guy ought to get the gold star. But I tell you what, there's a verse over in Revelation chapter 21. I love this verse because this is one of those universal verses that works on everybody from age three or four all the way up. And you say, how do you use a verse like this on a five-year-old? Just read it to them and see what happens. I've used this, work, this verse at camp all the time. And here's what it says. Verse 8, 21 verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all what? Liars. Shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's a good verse to start preaching at the prison with. It's a good verse to start preaching anywhere with. Because when people see that, they don't associate themselves with those, all those other things. But when it comes to liars, they know, don't they? In Romans chapter 3, Paul says, Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. So mom's got to put up with a lot. She's got to put up with all the lying going on and try to decipher. And can a mom know when you're lying? Oh, yeah. Yeah. She knows. She can tell. And, and so you can't get it, Pastor. You know. Uh, look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. Here's a young man who had two moms. 2 Timothy chapter 1. He had a mother and a grandmother. Both of them active in his life. There again, tells you about the second generation. And, and this whole idea of having two generations helping raise your kids, 
is fantastic because nobody knows more about raising kids than the person who raised you, okay? So they have the experience. So you draw on them. Notice what he says in verse 5, uh, verse 4. Paul says to Timothy, he says, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Now remember, when he writes to Timothy at this time in his life, Timothy had been with him from the very beginning of his ministry. So this young man, he took him out of his home as a child from Eunice and Lois, and he took the boy with him, and he became a mentor and a teacher to him. And he took care of him, and he took him on his travels. And, and young Timothy saw it all. I mean, if anybody saw it all, it was him. And he was with him from the very beginning. So there's those tears. You think he had some tears while he was doing some of the things he was doing with Paul? I guess so. Some things they might have seen happen. I, I don't think we see a big picture. We see a big picture, but I don't think we see a, a detailed picture of all those things because it's just too much that went on over that 30 year, 35 year period. What happened was a lot took place and not much of it was, was really something that most people would want to give their life to do. It, it, it started out rough and it ended up in complete and total failure. And 2 Timothy is the last book he writes. And he's talking about remind, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. Now there's two important mothers here. Look at verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt what? First in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice. And I am persuaded that in thee also. Did they do their job? Yes. It's not false faith. It's not, these people aren't fakers. These, these ladies would never have let him go if they didn't believe who Paul was. That tells a lot about him right there. And he says, he says, and uh, he says, and I am persuaded that in thee also. He says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now, this is a tremendous thing because here you see that he, he had these two important people in his life. And uh, what kind of father did he have? Do you remember? His father was a Greek. And that's the reason that one of the things that Paul did with Timothy uh, having a Jewish mother and a Greek father, he was uncircumcised. They had not circumcised him. And so one of the first things he does after fighting this tremendous battle over circumcision, what does he do? He gets to the, he gets to the place where, where they're there, and one of the things he does to the people, the, the leadership, is that he circumcises young Timothy. Now that seems a little strange to fight this... this this battle <laughs> where these people are saying, yeah, you can believe, but you've got to be circumcised in order to be saved. And then he turns around, he fights that battle, and he, and he refutes the whole idea. And then he turns around and he takes this young boy, and one of the first things he does for these Jewish people that are leaders is what? You, you know why he did that? I, I think he did that, and this very early on. Uh, matter of fact, it's, it's probably in the area that he lived because... They, they all knew his father was a Greek. And for them to, to give audience to what Paul was trying to teach them, this was a very important issue. And, and Paul did it for that reason. And you say, well, didn't he, didn't he, did he use him? Sure he did. He used him. That's exactly what he did. And he used him his entire life. And he's using him right here, too. Matter of fact, he's writing his last letter to him to, to tell him what to do and how to do it in these areas. So, so when you're dealing with this, you, you see how, how important these mothers were, his mother and his grandmother, and, and how they passed on the information to him 
And uh, Jason said a while ago, Timothy was probably not saved by Paul. He was saved when he got there. He was already a saved kid. And so when he comes, uh, evidently, they hit it off pretty well, and, and he, he left with Timothy. He took him. So what a fantastic thing, although it must have been sad for his mother and his grandmother to see him go, to worry about him so much. They still, they instilled in him that maturity that he needed to go. Uh, he must have been uh, some kid to be able to do that, to take him on such a journey as that and to, and to keep him and do those things and to, and, and to put him into the ministry. You see, you see how he, he talks about the, the putting on of his hands, ordaining him, putting him into the ministry and, and making him the pastor at Ephesus and so forth. So tremendous thing. And there's a tremendous responsibility there for those mothers and they took on that responsibility. One of the things that moms need, look, go, go to 1 Corinthians with me. This is one of the greatest assets a mom has in raising children. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, or chapter 2, I'm sorry, in verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <clears throat> verse 9, he says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things uh, which God hath prepared for them that love him. Uh, the natural man does not understand the things of God, therefore it's not something that normal people see. They don't see it. Believers begin to see it. Look at verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but or except the Spirit of God. Teach him that. Now, the advantage here is having the Holy Spirit in it, you see, in the whole thing. In other words, having the, the Holy Spirit involved in the family, having it involved in the marriage, having the Holy Spirit involved in the, chil in the lives of the children by teaching them, and this all involves what? The mother being saved. Don't you, doesn't your heart go out to mothers who are lost, who, don't, who are trying to do this without being saved? I think that's one of the greatest ministries that saved, men, uh, saved women can have is to reach out to lost mothers because they have so many things in common raising children. How could they not have just hours and hours of stuff to talk about? It's easy. When you talk about business to business, this is mom to mom stuff. This is, this is what mothers can do. What a great way to set somebody up to help them raise their children, the first thing they need is the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Well, how would you know them if you didn't read them? Right? I mean, how would you know? Look over at Romans 8. I mean, people say, well, if, if somebody ever asks you, how do you know you're saved? The answer is not, I just know. That's not the answer. The answer is what? Look at Romans 8. Verse 16, he says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Well, how do you learn that? Well, he just, he just, he just, I just feel it. Yeah. And Isaac felt his son Jacob's arm, too, and it was hairy, but he was a smooth child. He didn't shave it. He took hair and glued it on there, and his mama helped him. <laughs> she took part in the deception. <laughs> wow. And you say, wait, how do I know? Well, I just know because I feel it, or I, I just, I, I've just known it. I've had people tell me, well, I've always believed. Really, since you were like three, two, one? I told you about David Jordan's boy at camp a couple years ago. I said, uh, I was talking to him. Both of his boys were sitting there. At, there, there were a couple of characters, Huey, Louie, and uh, the other one. I forget his name, <laughs> Chewy or whatever. <laughs> But the, the two that were there, the, there was just two of them at camp. The other one was too young, and Cole's not ready yet either. But the two of them are sitting across from each other, and they're talking. And I'm, in, I'm involved with their conversation a little bit, and I ask him, I said, when did you get saved? He goes, when I was two. 
I said, don't lie to me. Don't you lie to me about that. You didn't get saved when you were two. Maybe three, four, something like that, maybe. You know, <laughs> he just kept changing it. <laughs> but he wanted to make sure that it was the lowest possible number that he could get because he wanted to be saved longer than his brother or anybody else at that table. You know, so two, yeah, two. That's really hard to believe, isn't it? Well, no, it's, it's just funny, but it, yeah, it is hard to believe. How do they know? Well, how does anybody know? The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How does he do that? He does it by this book. The Holy Spirit teaches you the book. And so if your mom is going to learn how to teach you the Bible, what does she have to have? Look at Titus chapter 2. She has to have the Holy Spirit in her. If she's, not, if she's going to learn anything from her Bible, you know, one of the saddest things I've ever seen in my life is, is young people trying to teach their parents the Bible. <clears throat> It's, it's backwards. Titus chapter 2. It's a great thing when they receive it. Don't get me wrong. Um, Susie Grest, a good friend of ours from over in Switzerland, uh, her daughter was living over here in the Pacific Northwest or with some of the Grace folks out there, and she got saved. And so mom comes over and visits with her, and mom got saved. And so mom goes back home, and, and she's been dealing with her husband, who's not saved, but she's, been begin, she's begun to teach her grandchildren, because she's got other children, and she's got a lot of grandchildren. And, and over the last uh, eight or ten years that I've known her, she's just really been going at, you know, studying that book. And boy, I tell you, she's an accomplished student now. She's been gone, I don't know how many videos she's watched and, and lessons she's done, but, but her, her daughter, who now lives over there with her, she, uh, she also teaches. She teaches uh, English and so forth, and, and she, she helps tutor people and so forth. And together they teach children the Bible, their own and others. And they live in a village that nobody knows what they're talking about because they just go to this particular church and they don't know anything else but just go there and do the rituals and leave. They just they don't know anything. And, and so it's been fantastic to watch her grow and to see how this little lady, <clears throat> and she reminds me very much of Jan, that this little lady who just, she didn't know anything about the Lord Jesus Christ, gets saved, and now you sit down and talk to her about a con with any kind of conversation with her, and boy, she's, she's proficient. I mean, she's good in her understanding. She loathes, and, and it's good to see that. It's good to see a mother who has a grasp of her Bible because she needs it. I mean, believe me. All women need it, but especially moms, because if you don't, what's going to happen? They're going to use Dr. Spock. Remember the little girl across the street that lived across the street from you? What was her name? Molly. Molly, yeah, beautiful child. And her mother was raising her according to Dr. Spock. And her and Molly would go at it time to time, and Molly began to quote Dr. Spock's book back to her. That's not what Dr. Spock says. Well, if you quit using Dr. Spock's book, maybe she wouldn't quote it back to you, you know. Uh, and and what will happen is she teach her the Bible, she'll quote it back to her. That's profitable, by the way. If your child quotes you a verse, <clears throat> that's okay. Let them do it. Let them practice on you if they have to. Uh, just make sure they don't do it in the wrong way. However, Titus chapter 2 says this. This is important. They're to be teachers. Look at Titus chapter 2 in verse 3. The aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers, what? Of good things. Well, that would begin with the gospel, wouldn't it? It'd be a good thing to teach your kids the gospel and get them saved. Teach them, see, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, Good, you see, teachers of good things, it produces what? People that are good. She's good. Obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So they're to love their husbands and obey their husbands. Uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> so many women that, that are trying to go through this process uh, are having to deal with husbands that don't know it either. And I think sometimes the last person they want to hear it from is their wife. Because they, don't, they just don't want to do that. And uh, I, I've seen it work both ways. <clears throat> and it's usually a failure when the husband doesn't want to learn it. 
it's usually uh, a success when the husband says, yeah, okay, let's study the Bible. Because that takes time. And when a man finds out he's supposed to be the spiritual leader of the home and he's supposed to, to be the teacher and he's supposed to do these things and he hasn't done it and he realizes, well, this, I should have done this a long time ago. Yeah, but now's the time to start, right? This is what it's all about. The Holy Spirit helps her teach and be a teacher. It helps her demonstrate purity. You notice what it says again in verse 3. The aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh what? Holiness. So this idea of purity so that she can live before her children as an example. Look at Romans chapter 8. What does she need at the end of the day? Well, <clears throat> keep running back to Romans 8. Boy, if you're a mother, you're going to go to Romans 8 a lot. That's why they call it the soft pillow of the Bible. You have a Romans 5 week, you're going to run to Romans 8 to get it taken care of. Lots of tribulation, you need help, don't you? Romans chapter 8, as I mentioned to you constantly now, the Romans chapter 8 has the Holy Spirit mentioned 19 times in just in the first few verses, within the first eight, 17 verses, I guess. <clears throat> and it's only mentioned once in the book of Romans before that. So what happens when you, when you start to go through this process of raising children, you're pulling your hair out. And uh, that really doesn't actually happen until they turn in their teen years, okay? <laughs> you say, what kind of kids did you have? <laughs> we were pretty fortunate with ours. They didn't give us much trouble. But in the teen years, they all go crazy, okay? They, com have, they completely, it's almost like they're possessed with devils, okay? I mean, they complete, their, their personalities just change and morph, and it's all they can do to just make that transition from child to adult. It's, just, it's, a, it's a tough thing. Romans chapter 8, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. <laughs> it is, yes. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. Peace is what mom needs in the midst of all this. Peace under pressure. And uh, she needs it because there's lots of pressure. There's comfort, so she can continue on. She sometimes needs to make a stand. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. You say, well, what would a mom have to make a stand against? Well, <clears throat> what's going on in the neighborhood might be one. <clears throat> what's going on at school might be another. Because here's why. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. In, in the midst of all this, in the midst of all of this, you see that you've got this trouble with the kids, you've got this trouble at school, you've got this trouble in the neighborhood, you've got this trouble with your husband, you've got this trouble with you know, family members, all through, all the things that you have to deal with. And, and you're supposed to get all this stuff done, do all the work, do all this stuff, and still try to look good too. And, and to be a wife on top of it. Now, what happens? Ephesians chapter 6, you find out something that's really scary. Look at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In your family, who do you think the devil's going to try to go after first? You, okay, as mothers. And then the children. Or maybe vice versa. It might, might happen in a different order. I'm, I'm going to tell you, they, they kind of develop into their own little brand of devil on their own. But the idea is that their old natures are, are not being controlled yet. Uh, even if they're saved, they still have that old nature. And even then though they're saved and they start you know, growing in the Lord a little bit, they still have that, that conflict going on, but they don't know how to master that. They don't know how to... Rest, they're wrestling with it constantly. And that conflict is a problem for them. And uh, sometimes they act out that sort of thing. Notice what he says. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And by the way, <clears throat> notice what it says. Rulers of the darkness of this world. How do they rule us here in this world? 
their spiritual wickedness in high places, how do they control what's going on here? Uh, turn over to Ephesians chapter 2 and you'll see it. This is, this is really basic, you know, satanic policy of evil 101 stuff right here. Look at this. And ye, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, and you, excuse me, hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now notice what he says about bringing up your past. He says, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. It's worldliness. See, that's how Satan gets your children. It's through worldliness. It's through trying to get them uh, to be involved in worldly things so that the world gets them. And as you raise teenagers, you know what you see? You see the world getting them more and more every day, every week, every month, every year. You see the world having that grip on them. I can't tell you how many times I've said to my own children, where did you learn that? I didn't teach you that. Where did you learn that? So I know where they learned it. They learned it on television, reading, the internet, school, friends, whatever. They learn it everywhere. You know what? They're vulnerable. Notice what he says. He says, according to the prince of the power of the air, the course of this world is run according to who? It's, it's according to the, what the prince of the power of the air wants to do. He's the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now, somebody asked me one time, how is Satan, since he's not omnipresent, how can he work in everybody at the same time? Well, <clears throat> I don't have to work inside of each of you to scare all of you. I could scare every one of you really bad, okay? And I could do it by a pervasive spirit. And that pervasive spirit, or that spirit he talks about, that now worketh in the children of disobedience, is part of his doctrine and his system of teaching that he puts into the world. And what happens is it becomes culture. You want to see how dark things are? I could take you to some places in this town, in this area, and you'd say, man, this is bad. Let me go. I want to get out of here. Well, get on a plane and let's go somewhere else. How would you like to land in Nigeria? Like we were just talking about a while ago, or Kenya. Or some of those places in which you get off the plane and you better have a gun. Or you might, you might have to use it. You see, there, there are things going on out in the world by people who don't give a hang what your children are doing or whether they're even yours. They'll just take them and use them. They'll take them from you and sell them, which is what they're trying to do now. That's what Paul talks about, being man-stealers. And, and, and they do this stuff because they're wicked. And in and, and this course of the world that's being run by this spirit that now worketh, notice, in, not on, in. Now, there's a big difference between working on somebody, like Satan tries to do. He has to use tricks, like Ephesians 6. He has to use wiles and tricks, and he tries to get you to persuade you to quit believing the way you believe so that you'll believe what he's trying to get you to believe. But here, he's doing it in the children of disobedience. In other words, he's partnershiped with worldly people. That's what the culture is. And these pervasive cultures that you see around the world, you say, wow, what do they do that for? So it's so terrible over there, they eat each other. Man, they eat each other over here, okay? In the United States, yeah, it's happened many, many times. Cannibalism isn't confined to, to New Guinea and, and you know, <laughs> those islands. It's, it's everywhere. It can get that bad. And you say, well, people do what they got to do. No, they, they do what they're taught to do. And I'm sorry, you know, you walk up to a place and there's a bunch of poles with little bitty heads on them. You go, what do they do around here? Kind of makes you <laughs> say, hey, man, I think I don't, I don't like this culture too much. Well, this worldliness that's out there, they're trying to get the kids. And you need to make a stand, okay? Turn to Colossians 3. It's about done. Colossians 3. <clears throat> We've to we told you over the years that y y your, your kids have to learn that you're going to fail as parents. They're going to do that. They're going to have to learn it. They learn it later in life, but the sooner you teach it to them, the better. As you forgive them and teach them about forgiveness, you begin to learn 
more about forgiveness also. Don't, don't children forgive very easily? I think they do. They forbear and they forget. And, and sometimes they get a little disappointed. Sometimes they'll call you on it. And sometimes they'll, they'll push you to the limit and uh, make you do things you probably shouldn't have done. However, you know, in the idea of this, I, I want you to get this. Moms, in, in, in getting the help from the Holy Spirit, one of the great things that can help her and help all of you that are mothers is to forgive. That means forgive your husbands, forgive your children, forgive everybody around you. You be the person who's the forgiver, not the person who's holding the grudge. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. That's who you should be. Somebody who's holy and beloved. All right? People love people that forgive. They're easy to be around. People that forgive, I mean, people that forgive you all the time, they're, they're easy to be around. People that don't forgive you, they're the ones that are problems to be around because there's a constant rub there. He says here, he says, holy and beloved, you see. Bowels of mercies filled up with that merciful attitude, kindness, humbleness of mind, not proud all the time, but humble, meekness, long-suffering. Boy, that's, that's something a mom needs. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man, and you can say this as a woman too, for a woman, if any man or woman have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. I had a lady in tears here not a couple years ago, and she came up to me and she said, I, I can't do it. <laughs> she just said she couldn't forgive. And I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. What's the alternative? How long do you want to hate this person? <laughs> Revenging evil for evil is not good. How should you treat your, your, your friends and your family and those who are in Christ? Well, let's go back over to 1 Timothy again. In taking care of your parents, this is something that I think is interesting, what Paul says, right back where we were, chapter 5, verse 4. He says, but if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home. That's where they should learn it. And he says, and to requite their parents. If you want to demonstrate piety, where should it start? They say charity begins at home. Piety begins at home also. What's one of the ways Paul's trying to get them to use this piety? He says, and to requite their parents. That means to give back in return. Now, requite can mean good or evil, here, the context is clearly good. He says, for that is good and acceptable before God. You see? So when you see this idea of moms driving around with a bumper sticker that she, she says, or, or whatever or grandpa says, that we're out spending our children's inheritance. You know, that jokey little thing they have. Well, Paul says that the parents are supposed to lay up for the kids, not the kids for the parents. But that's when they're growing up, okay? There's nothing wrong for laying it up for them. But the idea is what happens when they get older and they need help. The children are supposed to requite their parents. They're to take care of them. Just like the Lord hanging there on the cross, he says, behold your mother. John, there she is. She's yours now. She got a new address that day. I think that's pretty clear when you start looking at it. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Mothers have a real ministry. Man, I'll tell you, it's, it's amazing. There's so much ministry for moms. Paul quotes the first commandment with promise in Ephesians 6. 1. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Meaning that if they try to make you do something that's not suitable in the Lord, your conscience won't allow it, make your stand. He says, for this is right. So but when they're giving you good advice and, and trying to teach you things that are right and, and scriptural and honorable, obey them in it. 
Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So you go back to Exodus chapter 19 and look at the, the passage. It was good advice for them to learn to listen to their parents. Because their parents would be able to help teach them the things they needed to get through life. Look at uh, Exodus 19 and verse 12. The fifth commandment, he says, Honor thy father and thy mother, and here's the promise, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, when I used to, I used to think that verse meant that if they would do that, automatically they would have longevity as a, as a particular blessing from God. Exodus 19, or Exodus 20, I'm sorry, verse 12. I gave you the wrong chapter there, sorry. Exodus 20, verse 12. And he says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. If you listen to your parents, there again, they raised you. If you listen to your parents who are more educated, have more experience, are older in years and so forth, what's going to happen? This first commandment with a promise, this promise that's attached is a promise that the education that you get from that will benefit you in life. It might keep you from running out in the street, getting hit by a car. It might keep you from playing with firearms. It might keep you from swimming with sharks in the ocean. <laughs> Who knows what they're telling you not to do, okay? But, but if they tell you not to do it, don't do it. Or if they tell you to do it, do it. Obey them. They represent God to you and have all your life. Trust them. You see why it's so interesting to me. I, I love this because when, when you see adults and children who are in the Word of God together as they're being raised and they're actually having discussions about the Word of God and they're, they're teaching and they're learning from each other, you realize, I mean, how are you going to know what your child knows if you don't listen to what they're doing? Okay, if you're teaching them something and, they're not, and you're not getting some feedback from them and, and you're not seeing where they are in the scriptures, how do you know where they are? You don't. So as you monitor all this, what happens? You actually begin to have fellowship with them. So your daughter becomes your sister in Christ when she gets saved. Your son becomes your brother in Christ when, you get, when he gets saved. See? Because this is how family is supposed to be. But the fact is that they begin to learn these things and they begin to grow. In all of this, it's a difficult thing because sometimes kids don't want to study their Bibles. They're bored. They say it out loud. We were at camp one year and a gentleman was speaking, you know, giving some information, trying to tell kids what, what had to be done, what they could do, what they couldn't do. And this kid, he was brand new, he raised his hand, I guess, you know, and he just left it up. And he's just being ignored, because he was talking about some pretty important stuff. They just ignored him. So finally, they said, what's your question? He goes, are you about finished? <laughs> and uh, that night they called me out of my bed in a cabin full of kids and they said w w we got problems with this kids man with this kid he's got to go <laughs> he was causing so much trouble and they had to separate him from his cabin and they didn't know what to do with him so they called me like thank you guys i thought you were my friends okay and so they said well the cabin next to you is empty we had there's two cabins in one building I said, there's nobody, we didn't have enough kids to, we just filled one side that year in that cabin. So they said, you can take him over there and see if you can calm him down and get him straightened out. I said, so I began at the beginning. And he, 
I let him talk a while, and then I talked a while, and uh, it found, uh, we found out that I could out-talk him, and he went to sleep. And uh, when I started talking to him and he didn't answer, I started laughing. I was cracking up because he's a ding-dong, okay? And he was one of these that y you, you could have put him on a bus and sent him home right then, and nobody would have said anything about it. Was, okay, great. <laughs> He was one that, that taught everybody how to be patient that year at camp. And it wasn't but two days into camp and everybody else is dealing with him so that the adults didn't have to, okay? So put your hand down. Be quiet. You know, they just kept dealing with him. He was funny. Sometimes there's a lot of difficulty that way with kids, right? I'm sure his mom and dad were very happy he was at camp, okay? And we were happy he was there, but he was tough. He was a tough one. This is why moms need our prayers. <laughs> and uh, this is why their ministry is so important to the young ones. They need strong, faithful husbands to help them. They need good friends and helpers to help them. And they deserve the honor and the respect that God's word says they deserve. Marriage and family are the foundation of all humanity. They are God's design for us, and we should do everything we can do to support and promote the idea of the family. Okay? And today we do that for the moms. It's an important thing. When you see a family that it's clicking on all cylinders, and you say, is there is such a thing, really? <laughs> When you see a family that's clicking on all cylinders and, the, and things are working out pretty good and the kids are saved and they're growing in grace, they're making good decisions in their life, staying out of trouble, it's a good thing. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the moms that we have in this assembly uh, and we thank you for the little ones here and the opportunity to watch them grow. We thank you for it today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.